Tennessee This Week from WATE 6 on your side starts now. Hello and welcome to Tennessee This Week. Good to be with you. I'm Don Hudson. We have several issues that we are going to get into, including the presidential race and the candidates, also Governor Lee and Donald Trump exchanging a few words, and stuff that's going on with the city council and elections. But first, Governor Lee ramping up talk about his school voucher proposal. The program would provide money for private schools for thousands of Tennessee students. State lawmakers voted it down last session. The governor immediately said he'd bring it back in the next session. Now, that starts in January, so we're still a little ways out. But we wanted to find out more about the school vouchers. So our own Lori Tucker talked with the governor, also a respected educator and a local mom. The three don't agree on the value of the vouchers. So where, where will your dot be? Be right here. Exactly. At Community Evangelistic Church in East Knoxville. That's a shark. That's a shark. That is a shark. The Kasinga kids, five brothers and sisters, are supplementing their summer learning with the help of Lashinsky Emerson. Just like you did that one. Who founded the tutoring nonprofit A1 Learning Connections and uses space at the church for some of her sessions. She sees 250 students a year. It is a passion for me. It is a ministry for me. And I want want to see all of our families to be able to be successful, to be productive, to be uh, constructive citizens. Emerson is against Governor Lee's school voucher program, which failed last legislative session. The governor told me the plan he's bringing back this time around likely won't have many changes. I suspect the numbers will be very much the same, uh, and, the, and the idea would, would be that fundamental premise that now not only parents that can afford to send their kids to a school choice of their own, but those who could previously not afford it now being able to do so. The voucher program would provide $7,075 in state funds to 20,000 K-12 through students in Tennessee looking to attend a private school. The governor now calls the voucher program school choice. Emerson says it's not a choice at all. So that $7,000 is not enough money to pay for a year of tuition for private school education in our area. So where are my families going to get the, the, the extra? They don't have it. The Kasinga kid's mom, Paulette, says she couldn't afford the extras. Thinking of all the expenses that goes with uh, private school, like parking lunch for them, field trip will be costly. It's all out of your own pocket. Books that you have to purchase, any uniform. And not only are most private schools much higher than $7,000 a year, Kasinga says the odds are against all five of her children even getting the grant money, including one child with disabilities. It won't feel fair. One child will be like, why not me? Why my sibling has to go to private school, not me? Emerson is concerned the program would cause an increase in racial and socioeconomic segregation and has this question. When we take public funds for private education, what are our kids going to be taught? What is the educational curricula? What are, what's going to be left out? Back at Community Evangelistic Church. We're a community church and we're concerned about our community. Its pastor says knowing the families he serves and school vouchers not providing a full ride to private schools, where's the benefit? Aren't they already paying for the education system through their taxes? Now you want to encumber them by paying for public schools as well as private schools. Uh, that's my concern. What do you say to critics of this? Well, you always have critics and changing the status quo is hard. And we have had status quo for a long time. Um, but we're seeing that change across the country. There is a growing awareness that parents know best. And we ought to empower parents to make those choices. All right, so let's talk about this. And joining us today are WATE political pundits, Courtney Piper, Craig Griffith, and Michael Covington. So <clears throat> vouchers, it, it, now it's going to be round two, I guess, maybe round three, who knows how long. How much is the plan going to have to change for it to actually pass this time around? Well, I don't think that our recent elections changed the equation for vouchers in the state legislature that much. Uh, there were some uh, people that were opposed to vouchers that lost, but there were also some voucher supporters that lost. So I don't know how the dynamics, the vote count has changed. Uh, but the issues with the voucher program are the same as now as they were before the election. There's still the issue of 
taking that money away from public schools, even though they say that money can't go, that this will not be money that comes from public schools. But you know, somewhere in the pot to pay for it, public schools could have gotten more money. Uh, secondly, there's the resistance from the rural counties who feel that they are going to be required, uh, rural county school boards, who feel they're going to be taken into having a lot of accountability for the success or failure of their students, whereas the schools that the vouchers can be used in do not have those same requirements for accountability. So I don't see where the dynamic has changed. And of course, there's the main issue, $7,000 doesn't cover many private school right. fund uh, tuitions. So you are you have to make a lot of changes, in my right. opinion. And Courtney, is, is the, the governor, I mean, on the surface, is he trying to do something to make education better, but maybe some people say, yeah, this isn't the way to do it. It's completely misguided. The argument that vouchers offer parents a choice is just not accurate. Parents already have a choice. They already have the choice to send their kids to public school, to private school, to homeschool. That already exists. Framing this issue like giving parents money that would enable them to send their kids to private school, also a false argument because ultimately those private schools can tell students, no thank you. You have special needs that are too great. We don't like your disciplinary record. Your grades aren't good enough you are rejected from attending this school. Furthermore, they cannot welcome you back for the next school year. So private schools are not offering parents a choice because ultimately the private school has a say in if they will accept you or not. And Michael, how do you see this? Because there clearly are some schools that underperform, that, that, that need help. We get these you know, gradings of our schools and not just here in Tennessee, all over the country. But do you, how do you see this plan? Is that what it's trying to attack? Is it, is it going after those to make sure that those kids don't have to go to a school that maybe underperforms? Exactly. Um, the voucher system will work. The voucher system will pass eventually. The parents of the young people that will be leaving public school and going into other learning situations will be responsible for the difference between that seven seventy one hundred dollars and whatever the balance is. That's their responsibility. It's disingenuous for folks to, to think that they should assume responsibility for a parent's assumption of that amount of debt or that amount of cost. It's, it's not anyone else's business. If the voucher program passes, and it will, when it does, those parents who have needed an opportunity to get their child out of underperforming schools or out of public schools, period, which are not as desirable as public school proponents would say it is, as soon as it happens, those parents are going to make the arrangements necessary to get their child where they think their child can perform best and get the best education. But the buck does not stop with the parent with a private school because the private school can reject that child for any reason whatsoever. Unlike a public school system that has to take every child that walks through their door regardless of their background, regardless of their socioeconomic status, regardless of what special needs they might have. Private schools have the ultimate say in whether they will accept or reject a child that has nothing to do with the parent. Now, I'm gonna, I mean, obviously, I'm not trying to really argue here so much as that I worked in a school system when I was a substitute teacher and, and there were alternative schools. There were kids mm -hmm. that were being removed from school and told you can't come back here, and so they do go but to alternative schools. But they're still in the public school system. The, they're not saying the, the public school system cannot reject students and say you are not welcome at Knox County Schools, for example. They can't do that. They can say you're going to an alternative school, you're going to this school, you're going to that school. With a private school, we'll just throw out Web or CAK, if your grades aren't good enough, if your needs are too great at, for special education, they can say no thank you. Michael's saying it's pass, it will pass eventually. Craig, what needs to change compared to how it was already presented if it's going to pass or has a political message been sent because of some of these elections? Well, I think they need to restructure the program that addresses these concerns of the manually rural uh, constituents, the rural school systems. And in the legislature, the rural legislators control. So until they make it more palatable to those individuals, you know, and I, you know, Frank nicely got beat up in Straw Plains in, in the state Senate, and I think he was responsive to the leaders of his local education authority when they, when they were opposed to the voucher program. Uh, but again, I think we need to get back and look at what's going to be best for the students. What, you know, that's the goal. The goal is to have well-educated students. 
uh, you know, the voucher program that already exists in the state in uh, Shelby, Davidson, and Hamilton counties, the data shows that the people going to the voucher schools is not they aren't doing any better than the people that are performing in, in the public schools. So is it an answer to a question? Is it, is it an answer to making our schools better, to making a better educated children in our state? So, and I think that the jury's out on whether vouchers are. Uh, in, in other states, you know, it hasn't been, you know, a miracle worker by any means, and especially in Arizona. Arizona, their, their state budget, is, it's four or five times what they had budgeted for their vouchers for all program. So it's a it's a big chunk of the of the budget, and we'll have to, you know. And again, the question is: Is this the best thing for students? Yeah. No, it is and, not. And we'll, we'll find out in January, right? And we'll see because they had a they had a shot to pass it. They already put it out there. The Republicans controlled pretty much every part of it, but they didn't pass it last don't, time. Don't leave out the benefit of the free market. As charter schools begin to flourish, they'll get into the rural areas. It'll pass. Uh, well, charter schools are totally different from vouchers. Right. Yeah. Charter schools are still yeah. public schools run by a public, by a private. Uh, vouchers is just here. You want to go to private school? Here's a check for you. But once you get, once you get those options, and the charter schools begin to go into the rural areas, it's a done deal. Uh, well, the problem on that is that the people that operate those charter schools don't look at financial viability of those rural areas. It'll be a long time before there's ever charter schools in that area. Well, we'll see now that you both have uh, put your guests down on the table. All right, still to come on Tennessee this week, our panel weighs in on this week's developments in the race for the White House. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Another big story that we're watching in the world of politics outside of Tennessee, of course, is the race for the White House. This week, the Vice President, Kamala Harris, announced her new VP pick. Former President Trump said that he would also like to debate Harris. He offered to be on Fox and I think NBC and ABC. I think the ABC is the only debate that is set right now for September. There's also going to be apparently a VP debate on CBS at some point. So we won't debate the debates, but let's get into the choices. This, the, the new news here is that the VP candidate was picked. I'm going to start with you, Michael, VP candidate, governor of Minnesota. Your thoughts? I was thrilled. I was absolutely thrilled with the selection. Um, Kamala Harris did not select Josh Shapiro and Josh Shapiro's 40 electoral votes in Pennsylvania. Uh, she selected a gentleman who uh, sat idly by and watched Minneapolis burn to the ground and admit his mistake later. That's the kind of running mate I'd like to see Kamala have, and I want to see her poll numbers reflect who he is and what he brings to the ticket. But is this, is this really at this point, I mean, that's the, that's the kind of rally stuff that you see, the, the kind of talking points, but what about policy-wise? How, how does he impact her delivery that her policy is the policy that we need for 2024 and beyond. Policy-wise, he has an extraordinary record of addressing kitchen table issues. So he was the governor that made free lunch available for all public school students. He was the governor that got free period products in all public schools. He's the governor that pa passed paid parental leave, codified abortion rights. Um, you know, the, his list goes on and on of these real relatable issues. And that's why I was so excited with this pick the more and more that you learn about him and his record and just his demeanor, he is funny. He is like every single Midwestern dad that I ever knew growing up in Michigan. He is relatable. He is joyful. He is hopeful. He's somebody that you want at your kitchen table having dinner. He's somebody I want to go grab a beer with. What? And that's what's going to win this election. And you contrast that with the Republicans who are on a terror of mean, angry, hateful rhetoric, just calling people names, trashing people, telling us how horrible things not, are. It's not and only it's Republicans. it's a nice little contrast. Governor Walls. First time out there, started calling people weirdos. So everyone, well, don't, don't, I mean, we, saying that somebody saying is things. calling a, a spade right. a spade and is well, different from saying and, and that Waltz. you know American democracy is in the can and women shouldn't be working and that's what's wrong with our society well, and yeah. blah blah Waltz blah blah blah. Walls put blah, tampons blah. in boys' bathrooms. Yeah. That's enough to disqualify him for me. But he yeah. put uh, tampons I, I in bath, boys' yeah. bathrooms. That's horrible. Now listen, what are his what are his downs? What's the downside of this VP pick? Well, first I'm going to say this election isn't going to be decided by policies. 
Okay. <laughs> we, we, I'm sorry. You know, there has been zero discussion of really significant policies. Well, a lot of the, a lot of the surveys me. say that economic issues are like the biggest thing to people, and, yeah. and, 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 and so, people are just going to vote on their on their passion for either candidate. So it's. But uh, what about that twenty percent in the middle? Because yes, you're right. You have well, I mean, all Democrats the polls are showing that the the middle is disappearing. That that the double haters uh, they've moved. The independent voters are dwindling in number, so I, you know, it's policy is not going to make it. I mean, it'd be great. You know, I've written a ton of political speeches, and you know, I've done really great policy speeches, <laughs> right. and I've looked out at the audience, and they were all, <laughs> you know, it's the cultural things that uh, excite people. Right. And now, you know, as as I've said on this program many times before, back in in um, the the winter. The polls, three quarters to eighty percent of the polling showed they didn't want either one of these gentlemen right. running for uh, for president. But, that, but so that's now, what we have. So now, we're, we're but, and that. now we have a new entry into that right. that may satisfy that position of those people who wanted somebody else in the election. They now have somebody else in the election. So we'll have to see how that uh, works in terms of, you know, the polls have moved in the direction of the Democrats, but, you know, it's still early. Uh, but, it, you know, it's only 90 days till the election. Probably less than that. There's probably states that start early voting in the middle of September. Right. And so they, we're probably, you know, only a month away. And I did so look I, it up just today because, like Rasmussen, some polls, Trump was back up five points, back up two in this one, statistically tied in this one. So it seems like they got that kind of well, bounce from the announcement. Five, and, you know, 538, you know, it has it as a virtual Right, deadline. that's what I mean. Yeah. You know, you're always going to have the Rasmussen's ones and the Gallup's that are outliers, and they don't really even use those in their in their aggregates. So, you know, I, I think that there is, you know, here they've, they're starting to define themselves. You have one party that's a bunch of coastal elites, you know, multi-millionaires. And then you have the other party where, as Courtney said, you know, that's everybody's pa or grandpa. And he, he is not a wealthy man by any means. The Wall Street Journal last week looked at the finances of both, you know, the multi-millionaire candidate on the Republican side and, and the um, Democratic candidate for right. vice president who, who doesn't even own a house because he lives in the governor's mansion. Right. So, you know... But is I, that really the issue? I mean, John F. Kennedy was rich. Ronald yeah. Reagan was pretty rich. No, there's, there's, there's no, other people. You know, wealth is not an issue. Right. In, 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 until you bring it up, you know, and then it becomes an issue. Right. So I think that the the coastal elites will have to justify what they're doing, just like the uh, other party, the Democrats, will have to as well. Three weeks ago, there was a no foreseeable path to victory for the Democrats. Well, right. And ever since the Democrats announced this change, we are now on the offense. Kamala Harris and her team are able to define herself on her team, and the Republicans are having a come apart because they've put, been put on defense, and we have sucked all the oxygen out of the room. Well, I, I, did, I mean, I don't know. I heard the President, uh, former President Trump had a, an hour press conference yesterday. One of the issues, and I want to bring this up, each you can quickly respond. Kamala Harris has not. Kamala Harris has not really sat down to talk policy with anybody other than about 90 seconds with reporters since this happened. Strategically a good move? Does she need to get out there? Is it going to change if she does sit down there instead of just having these rallies? Because those rallies are rallies, but interviews... You know, sure, I mean, Donald it's... Trump had an hour-long press conference where we, he had a temper tantrum and a come apart like a child. So <laughs> if you want to count that as addressing policy issues with the press, we can certainly count that. It's been three weeks for her, so I think you're going to see her get more and more as the campaign goes on and on and on. You will see her continue to weave in those more traditional aspects of campaigning. Michael, your thoughts on her sitting down and actually talking policy versus doing rallies? Kamala Harris has never effectively done that. In any debate that she has been in, and obviously Tulsi Gabbard just destroyed her in the, in the debate, and she got out of the race right after that when confronted with her record. She has not been a person who has performed well under the bright lights. She has not responded well when confronted. She will not respond well when she has to sit across or stand across from Donald J. Trump. It's just going to be an absolute slaughter. And I kind of feel a little bit sorry for her. I feel sorry for him. <laughs> I feel sorry for Trump, yes. You know, there, there's, there's a lot of negative baggage on both these candidates. And, you know, and, and, and you can't get into a character counts contest with either one of them because you'll lose. Right. That's definitely not what people apparently care about anymore mm -hmm. as his character. All right. Hey, still to uh, come on Tennessee this week, Governor Lee responding to being labeled a Republican in name only by 
former President Trump. We'll talk about that more when we come back. Governor Lee now responding to a comment made by former President Donald Trump. You remember that Trump recently called Lee a rhino, which is short for a Republican in name only. The governor's response was this. I mean, it doesn't change anything about how I feel about what we're doing or where we're going. And uh, everybody has their own style. The president has his. And, you know, I certainly uh, am hopeful that his style leads to him continuing to lead and be elected. But uh, I can't really explain what happened there. That's a comment by former President Trump, by the way, towards Governor Lee. It was made last week after the two supported different candidates in a race. That race here in East Tennessee featuring Bobby Harshberger, Diana Harshberger's son, and incumbent John Lundgren. So the, the little back and forth, big deal, no big deal. Well, I mean, Lee can't run for office again. So, you know, it doesn't matter whether he has Trump support or not. So I, I think that it's interesting in the fact that... Um, Governor Lee really pushed to have the Republican National Convention in Nashville. You know, he tried to get it. He right. put money in the budget for it. He was a strong supporter of it. And when the city of Nashville turned down uh, budget funds for the convention, he went crazy. Right. He, he tried to uh, take away the city's uh, half of the city council, reduce it from uh, 41 members to uh, like 20. He, he took away the city's authority to appoint their airport authority, took away his authority to, uh, to appoint to the sports authority. He got back at, you know, for uh, trying to stand up for the Republicans, and now the former president trashes him as a rhino. Yeah, big deal, small deal, no deal. It's classic Trump. Okay. It's classic Trump. Michael. No deal at all. Yeah. A rhino is a Republican just like anyone else. They might not be as solid, but Bill Lee's also the governor. Donald Trump will embrace him as soon as he's in the White yeah. House. He'll probably be in his cabinet. That's how the Don works. Okay. All right. Also, we want to talk about Knoxville City Council. They voted for a charter amendment to change how city elections are run. This is going to be up to voters to pass. I mean, it's going to be out there now on the ballot. What, what is the change? What are the changes that are being made? And then how, how do you think voters will vote on it? Well, I think it's important for folks to know that we have to do this. The right. state government said we have to change how the city of Knoxville does elections. So there will be a uh, amendment to the charter on the November ballot that says, hey, would you like to change how we do elections in the city of Knoxville, which will be you have to live in a certain district in order to run for office, but you will always be running citywide. There's no longer district races. If the voters reject that, then we go to the default that the state set, which is district only races. Your primary and general will be in your district, and then there can be at large seats that will always have to be citywide. Of, of the city council members, how does this affect every single one of them? And it, does it affect some more than others? It six. Six the districts. Yeah, it, is, it yeah. affects all the districts. Uh, but also what it does is sort of the underlying current here is the Knoxville representative that proposed this change, first of all, does not live in the city of Knoxville. Second of all, is a Republican. And I think her intent was try to get more Republicans seated on city council. But the proposal that was put forth, because the city is bluer, benefits Democrats. So uh, the strategy may have backfired on her. And Michael, how do you see it? Um, I see it as a gradual dwindling of minority representation on the city council. I'm okay with that. The city council is mostly under the thumb of the mayor anyway. Uh, so aside from potholes, what difference does it really make? But if, if District 6 is decided citywide and all the other districts are decided citywide, minority representation on the city council is just going to wither and die. And Craig? Well, uh, it, it doesn't change a lot, to right. tell you the truth. Uh, each member of the city council was elected citywide in the general election already. So now instead of having to run in a district in the primary, you'll just run citywide. So, you know, it's uh, will it uh, change what's going on? Uh, you know, this is the way people have had to run since the 60s. Right. So I don't know if it's going to change minority representation on it. The, the city council has a district representative that's a minority and an at-large uh, representative that's minority for the first time in history. So I'm not so sure it's going to have that drastic effect on minority representation on council. All right. And we have about 
Ten seconds left. Courtney, you want to add in anything to that? I have nothing else to add, Don. You, you've said it all. I've Michael, said it all. You got, the, you got the last chance to talk, say something? <laughs> That's what I've well, got. better be right now because we're running out of time. Hey, we want to thank you for watching. We'll see you next week on Tennessee This Week. The views of guests on Tennessee This Week are their own and do not represent the views of WATE 6 of your side or Next Star Broadcasting.